Good morning, good morning. Well, we start a new book today. And, uh, well, I tell you, I couldn't, uh, so much information about uh, Genesis that uh, took me a while to try to decide how to organize it. So I hope this comes out good as a beginning. I'm calling this the intro day one. So we're only gonna get past Genesis 1-1. I'm gonna go through a few things I think are kind of interesting when it comes to <clears throat> terms used, particularly the term God. And so kind of a little different format too. So I'm gonna use this as my backdrop and I'm just gonna bring in things uh, as needed uh, to show. So let's start with a prayer. Oh dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the new beginnings uh, in the, in the, uh, in the word you gave us and that uh, all the knowledge you've given us through the through your word. And may I do it justice, Lord, and please help me, Lord, to uh, be ever mindful of uh, honoring you. And I hope that my uh, explanation and my uh, teaching is uh, honoring to you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. <clears throat> I tell you, when I, when I really think about all the things that went into making this earth and the fact that he did it in six days we got we we serve one powerful god that's all i can say to that for sure <clears throat> so i'm going to start off with a little introduction of genesis and just a few basic facts uh it was written by moses and you're going to see in some of the uh, uh verses i quote that uh uh, many people said it, Moses wrote it, and I firmly believe that. Uh, the actual writing by Moses was, a, uh, they figure, somewhere around 1450 to 1410 B.C. You know, of course, this will be when Moses was uh, leading the uh, Egyptians out of uh, Egypt. And he went into, looks like he did a lot of this writing uh, towards the end of the 40 years in the desert. Or maybe during those 40 years, he was getting visions from God and uh and I started off with this first thing I wanted to show, because I think that it really tells us <clears throat> and get used to this new format I got. But this really tells us, it shows us exactly why uh, it can be pretty reliable, I think. It just based on uh, where we're starting with this is the fact that uh, I brought up this timeline. I can get rid of this and bring in some verses. So we got plenty of verses. But by looking at the verse of the genealogy from Adam to Joseph, we deduct that creation was actually about 405 BC. So that's why I brought up this chart. And the way they did it, is that they actually, they know that by, by, by uh, archeology span when exactly Abraham uh, was uh, born. It was 2000 BC. And from there, because the Bible tells us how old each person was when they had the next person behind them, you can find all these verses. I did it one time on my own, just to have some fun with it. And you really can, you can figure out uh, the, how far back so if we start at 2000 bc and we go backwards uh, here's the flood at 1656 bc that's the global flood uh that was actually 2348 bc and you can see when noah lived and i found fascinating by looking at this chart uh, as you go through noah and lamech and methuselah and enoch and jared all the way back to adam it's interesting to see, because they lived so long back then, if you really look at it, Adam died about here. And if you bring this straight down, you see that Noah's father was still alive uh, when, uh, when uh, Adam died. So Noah's own father was very familiar all the way back to creation. So that when you got this longevity like this, word of mouth uh, probably is even good enough to get a lot of this information uh, closer to when Moses actually wrote it. So some of the information might have been by uh, uh, by basic, uh, what they call oral tradition. 
you go back in history and a lot of and a lot of history was uh, was really written uh, with oral tradition before there was actually written words. But we do know that uh, when you get into the uh, period of time after Noah, that written word was being used and that uh, we have a lot of documentation to prove things. So I think that's the, the basis behind uh, how we can be so sure that uh, what we're seeing in Genesis, besides the fact that God wrote it, so that as Moses was writing this, I'm sure that God was uh, dictating to him. And you're going to see that through the New Testament, through the Old Testament, uh, it seemed like God appeared to people more often than he does, than he does now because he already finished his word. So while, while before written speech was really uh, taken a hold like it is now, where we have written speech and we have lots of documentation, God wanted to make sure his word was pure. So he spent more time telling them directly what to write. And, I, and you can see that all through the Bible. And I think that's why God wrote it when he did. Because if, you, if he tried to write it now, I think there'd be too many people trying to plagiarize it and, uh, and change it. Uh, and so that... Uh, I really think that he designed it that way to make sure it stayed pure. But anyways, so we put the, so we pretty much say that Adam was uh, created about 4000 BC. And so again, Genesis Genesis means beginnings. That's what the word means. Uh, records not only the beginning of the heavens and the earth and of plant, animal, and human life, but also of all human institutions and relationships. Typically, it speaks of the new birth, the new creation. Where all was chaos and ruin. Uh, with Genesis begins also this progressive self revelation of God, which culminates in Christ. Uh, the three primary names we see in, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, you'll see all the way through that is translated into God. There's three of them that are quite popular. The, the, the most popular one that's used for God is uh, Elohim, then you get Jehovah and Adonai. And we're going to see as we go through here, and I'm going to actually break these down so we can see examples of when these different ones are used. The inspiration of Genesis and his character as a divine revelation are, are authenticated by Jesus Christ himself, which I think is important. And that's what we're going to kind of look at here first. And I think I'll switch to... <coughs> What picture do I want to use? I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, this one here is, uh, remember the pictures we were using before? Uh, these are pictures that are out of that, uh, <laughs> the Genesis one, uh, there's not as many as we had out of the, uh, 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 for instance, the Daniel one, but there's still quite a few. Oh, didn't want that to happen. Still getting used to this new method I'm doing. Where it makes it easier to switch once I get used to it. Mm -mm. I'm finding I can blow up on certain aspects of the field and, and it's easier for you guys to see if I use PowerPoint. And so I'm projecting PowerPoint onto one of my screens so that we can, I can blow it up. And I use this magnifying glass to where I can really zone in on a certain area. So I found that useful. So I'll leave this as a picture. It's a family tree uh, starting at Adam and Eve. It's a real broad family tree. You know, we just kind of show it here. Uh, you see Noah there in the middle. And that goes to uh, his three sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, and this is just for the Jesus uh, family tree. And so the Jesus line came out of Shem. And then we go into uh, uh, Sarah and Abraham, Abraham being the first patriarch. And then Isaac, uh, and he married Rebekah. And Rebecca had uh, Ishmael and Jacob, who also got his name changed to uh, uh, Israel. 
And we also have, uh, as a son of Jacob's uh, issue, I mean, uh, these were twin brothers, uh, Jacob and Esau. Kind of showing the tree here. And out of Jacob, we got the 12th tribe of Israel. And remember, like, Jacob ended up with uh, four wives. And we got Leah, uh, which had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judea. Judea, which is be the, this is the line that Jesus came out of. A really neat painting, I think. Uh, Issachar, Zebulon, uh, and out of one of his handmaids, his one of the handmaids, uh, Belia, had Dan and uh, Naphtali. And out of uh, another one of the handmaids was uh, Zillapah, had Gad and Asher. And then out of his favorite uh, wife, Rachel, came Joseph, uh, who we know had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And we'll get to that story. That's a, uh, And then Benjamin. These are all the stories we're going to be talking about during Gen uh, Genesis. And then, of course, his other son, Benjamin. And, and uh, I never realized until I saw this, but it's true, that Saul of Tarsus came out of the Benjamin line. Well, then, no, that might be uh, King Saul. Oh, I've got to check on that. We will when we get to it. That all happens during Genesis. I'll leave that picture there for now while we go through some of these verses. So he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And I want to point to uh, some of these verses in the New Testament that talk about creation. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall become one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So, and jumping over to Matthew 24, 37 through 39. That's a famous one that uh, we'll be getting into a little bit when we talk about uh, what's going to be happening in our Daniel study. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See in this verse here, Jesus actually confirms a few things we already know that we're going to be studying in Genesis. And that's the fact that the creation and the flood. And that Noah really existed. So these are all these are all confirmation, I think, uh, of the, the Bible being true. Just realize Moses and Jesus lived, oh gosh, over two thousand years apart. Not quite that far. Moses was about, I think he was about twelve forty BC. So probably like to, at least twelve or thirteen hundred years before Jesus came about. Also in Mark ten four through nine. And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The twain shall become one flesh, so that they are no more twain but one flesh. But therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. So there are allowances for divorce, but it's, uh, it was never designed that way. Uh, so that even some of the multiple marriages that happened, there wasn't the in uh, initial intent for, uh, of God to have it happen that way. And a couple more here in Luke 11, 49 through 51. Therefore also saith the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. For the blood of Abel, that's why I brought this verse in, uh, we're going to be talking about him. He's one of the first children of, uh, of uh, Adam and Eve. From the blood of Abel until the blood of Zachariah, Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Jump into Luke 17, 26 through 30. Uh, two, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat and drink, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. 
Likewise, also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought and sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. This is another story we're going to read. I want to show these that uh, the Jesus himself uh, really showed that uh, the stories we're going to see in Genesis are going to be are, are confirmed by Jesus Christ. Jump into verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. And just a few more on this testimony of Jesus. John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We're going to be talking about light and darkness. It's interesting that they, uh, I remember in science we were always taught that the that darkness is the absence of light. But actually it's not. Uh, darkness is an entity all of its own. Kind of interesting. It's where black holes come from. Black holes are black because the gravitational pull inside of them is so strong that light cannot escape. Light is actually a physical property. And so it's a, it's a, it's a hard concept to, to comprehend, but believe it or not, that's why God is eternal, is because God lives outside of, God is, uh, his presence is outside time. He actually does, uh, designed time. And so in our minds, we always think of time as something that begins at a certain point and ends at a certain point. But time is actually a, a physical property. that You can change things by changing the time. And the thing about God is, and the reason he's eternal, is that uh, he's outside of time. I know it's, it's a really hard concept for us to comprehend, but that's, a, that's the best I can do on that front. Some more here in John 7, 21 through 23. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye are on the Sabbath day circumcised a man. If a man on a Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I have made a man even wet and whole on the Sabbath day. Uh, I just threw that one in there because I just like the, uh, I like it when the Pharisees of that time frame always like, like to try to catch Jesus in these, uh, uh, in these little catchphrases. And he always had a good comeback. John eight forty four, Ye are of your father the devil, and th lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Uh, I wonder, That's why I want to put this verse in here. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Jump into verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. We're going to be talking about this. That Jesus actually pre-existed his birth, uh, and he actually existed from day one of creation. And I'm going to try to explain well, how I see the Trinity. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to it today. I think that's during verse 2. But Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was... I am. And remember those words, because that's not, that's one of the words for God. And that's why in verse 59 here, they wanted to stone him for claiming to be God. They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Okay, so there's our proof that uh, Genesis is a true book. It was witnessed by uh, uh, Jesus himself as claiming that uh, that book is real. It was written by Moses. So we've confirmed that much of it. Just a few other things. Uh, I guess uh, Genesis is actually divided into five parts. And the five parts are creation. Uh, that's from Genesis 1 until Genesis 2.25. The fall and redemption, which is Genesis 3, 1 until Genesis 4, 7. The diverse seeds, Cain and Seth to the flood. The flood, and then uh, that's from Genesis 4.8 to Genesis 7.24. The flood to, uh, and from the flood to Babel, the Tower of Babel, Genesis 8, 1 to Genesis 11, 9. And from the call of Abraham to the death of Joseph. That'll be from Genesis 11, 10 to Genesis 50, 26. So that'll be the biggest part. So we'll be studying, uh, we'll be studying a lot about uh, the patriarchs, oh, these gentlemen right here, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we'll see all of those in... Uh, and we'll see up to right here.
I mean, yeah, did I, I didn't finish this, did I? I like the cool, I love this painting because of the way they, they drew it. So for out of Judea came David, the King David. We just talked about that. And, uh, uh, and so you can see how this fills out. In between here is where uh, Ruth and Boaz was, and it's part of the family tree. From David, it's where this split happened. And we go from David to Nathan, which was one of the sons of David and Bathsheba. That ends up at Mary. And that's how the seed, without going through the male line, uh, gets all the way to Jesus. And because Jesus' biological dad is God, that's how Jesus uh, ends up being uh, without sin. Whereas from David, through Solomon, the other son of David, goes to Joseph. And that's how we get the legal line, what they call it. And I just talked about this in Ruth, uh, through Joseph down to Jesus. But that's only legal. Uh, there's no biological connection between Joseph and Jesus. So that's what we were just talking about. So uh, neat painting. I, I like it. Uh, that's an actual, that's from the same uh, same website. If you ever want to buy some artwork and you like some of this stuff, you, you can actually, I think you can go and get prints of it. Uh, really full size prints you can put on your wall. Uh, it's from Bible. It's in the remarks section of the, uh, of the live stream if you ever want to uh, look it up. Okay, so we finally get to Genesis 1-1. Quite the uh, proclamation here. Uh, and that's why I, I named this series, In the Beginning, God. Everything started with God. And that's an important aspect. The first four words in the uh, book and the Bible itself, In the Beginning, God. And God did everything that happened and, and, and uh, oversaw everything that happened from page one all the way to Revelation 22. Uh, I like to think of it that way. Nothing's in there that he didn't want in there. And so the, the tricky part for us is to figure out why he put it in there in the first place. <laughs> now Genesis covers a period of 2,315 years. Uh, that was from a guy who did a lot of research by the name of Rush Usher. Uh, and some of these timelines I'm going to show you, uh, uh, that first timeline uh, that I showed you, that's that's from Usser that uh, did, did that timeline on all the ages and stuff. He did a lot of research into, uh, and he's the one that, just, that determined that, uh, that the uh, creation was about 4005 B.C. So beginning, let's talk about the word beginning. And that's basically what we're going to do the rest of this time today is to break down this verse. So the, I'm going to kind of point to some verses that talk about beginning. And over in Job, uh, Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, Job was actually written before the first five books of the Bible. Uh, just uh, uh, I don't know for sure how they prove that, but that's pretty well known by every, every theologian I've ever heard. And so Job is considered the oldest book in the Bible. And Job actually uh, is a great book to read. I particularly love the first chapter and the last chapter. Uh, uh, some of the stuff in between uh, the, where his three friends are, are talking to him gets a little uh, hard to understand. But uh, I'm going to jump to the, the, the latter section of Job and read a few things when God is actually talking to Job. So Job 38, I'm going to read one, th one through seven. And this is God talking. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darketh counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thee uh, me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare that thou hast understanding. God asked these questions knowing he's not going to get an answer because nobody was there before. Uh, but he's going to point to a few things that, uh, that actually prove that God is who he is. I won't go through them here, but there's a lot of things stated here that scientists have proven that no one would have known, uh, particularly when this book was written. Because a lot of stuff wasn't dis even discovered until modern technology was developed. Okay, continuing in Job 38.5. Who hath laid the measure thereof? If, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Wherefore are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? 
when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. It's going to be an important verse we're going to talk about when we get to, Gen uh, to Genesis 6. And some other uh, verses along this line over in Psalms 102, 24, and 25. I said, Oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, the years all throughout my generations. Of old, how hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Psalm 104, 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? That's something you hear a lot about today is that uh, the earth is going to die off in a certain period of time. God is in full control of this planet. Uh, we have at least uh, a thousand and seven years. If the rapture happened today, the, the, this planet will be around at least another thousand and seven years. Uh, and that's because uh, that's God's timeline for this planet to exist. Uh, before he makes a whole brand new planet after the after the millennium kingdom <clears throat> that's a long ways away so all these naysayers they keep wanting to say that the earth is going to uh, destroy itself in 20 years or by 2025 or 2050 or there's all kinds of theories out there god ain't gonna let it happen okay hebrews 1 2 Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. We're going to point to that verse too. And Jesus was here during this time frame. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Okay, now, this is my one of my favorite uh, testimonies of uh, who Jesus is. And it's in John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 14. Sometimes I don't read the whole chapter. Uh, it's kind of a, but all we, all we really need for this is the first three verses and then verse 14. It's all talking about Jesus. In the beginning, like there, that word again, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. God takes his word very, very seriously. But, God, but the word we're talking about here is Jesus Christ. The same was in the beginning with God. So this word was with God. And all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So that God and this word uh, made everything together. Now we're going to find out who the word is. And we jump down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us as we beheld his glory and the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. I think it's pretty plain what the word is. The word is Jesus Christ. That's the second part of the Trinity. And that's all the verses here. Uh, 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. John's just confirming what we just read. So now I'm going to take a look at some of the things that uh, uh, God's uh, names that God has used uh, in the Old Testament uh, to mean uh, service over Malachi 3.18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Okay, God is a trinity. That's in Matthew 28.19. I want you to make particular note of the word name here. Name here in this particular verse is singular. So let's read it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that name is identified as three, three, uh, three parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's Jesus speaking that. So uh, as the second part of the Trinity, he, I'm sure he knows who he is as all creator. Acts 17, 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. That was just a warning given, but mainly that first part that talks about the Godhead. The character of God is in Nahum 1, 2. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. His fatherhood of Israel over in Malachi 1, 6. A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If thou, I be a father, 
Who is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my faith? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name, and ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? And it goes on to talk about that that, that, that has to do with the things they were doing wrong and despising his name. I was, I'm doing this more to point to uh, uh, attributes of God. And all the kingdom is defined over in Matthew 6.33. Be circuit first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Great promise. And some of the, another, uh, talking about Old Testament names over in Malachi 3.18. Then shall ye return to discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. God in this particular verse is Elohim. And so I mean, I'm now going to point to a few places where we see where God's name and how it's how it's used. Before we do that, uh, finish that, we're going to also look at Jesus. Uh, Jesus' name, we see it uh, in the New Testament in Matthew 28, 18, and 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Notice that all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That puts him at God level. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Again, same thing we just read earlier. But I want to point to here is that the spelling of that name there, Jesus, uh, is actually uh, in the uh, Greek. Remember the Greek, uh, that the original Hebrew didn't have a J. And I think that the, uh, I can't remember, but I know that this particular word is spelt I-E-S-O-U-S. It's more like Asusus rather than Jesus. Uh, and so that would be a, a close, uh, but in the English, it's spelt Jesus because uh, we do have a J. So that I in that word has a J sound. Right? Jesusus, I guess would be how you would say it. So it's I-E-S-O-U-S, -S, but the I has a J sound. Okay, uh, the visibility in Christ or in John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So anyone who's ever seen God is, is the Son of God. And I'll try to explain, too, that, that whole idea of the Trinity. I think I already said that. Uh, it'll be tomorrow, though, because we're already past 30 minutes. I just got a few more things to talk about here before we get done for today. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Uh, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom so the Son will reveal him. I know it seems like I'm going through a lot of verses, but I'm trying to prove that Jesus is uh, was was here in the beginning during this creation. So I'm going to be showing you some verses that talk about him in his uh, physical form even prior to his birth. All things are delivered to me, uh, Luke 10, 22. All things are delivered to me and my Father, and no man knoweth whom the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So let me see where I'm at here. Yeah, almost done. So I'm just going to here quickly go through a few of the names that uh, uh, for God. We talked about Elohim. Elohim, believe it or not, is plural, which is interesting. That's the other thing I wanted to mention in that name where it says the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It just means that, if plural, uh, that the name Elohim is actually a plural sounding name, but it's talking about the three, uh, the Trinity, the three parts of the, the whole, and the whole being God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The singular version of that is actually called uh, Eloi, Eloi. Uh, is often used in short form of El. You might hear that word sometimes. And uh, one, of the, one of the uses would be like El Shaddai, uh, which is God Almighty. The name by which God was specifically known to the patriarchs. Uh, a lot of the patriarchs knew him as uh, El Shaddai. And we see this in Genesis 17.1. Now again, in English, we're gonna, it's going to be translated into uh, uh, English. And we use God for most of it. We also use Lord. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the might, almighty God, 
Walk before me and be thou perfect. Also Genesis 28, 3. And God will money bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Exodus 6, 3. And I prepared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. For my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Jehovah is the next name we're going to talk about. Jehovah denotes specifically the one true God. Uh, it's one uh, whose people the Jews were and who made them the guardians of the truth. Uh, the name never applied to a false God, nor to any other being except one, the angel Jehovah which is thereby marked as one with God and one who appears again in the new covenant as God manifested in the flesh. Thus much is, much is clear, but all else is beset with difficulties. At a time too early to be traced, the Jews abstained from pronouncing the name for fear of its uh, irrelevant use. Uh, this custom is said to have been founded on a strained interpretation of Levi, uh, Leviticus 24.16. And he blasphemed the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as a stranger. As he that is born in the land, when he blasphemed the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. They took this so seriously that they didn't want him to even speak the name of God anymore. And so that they shortened, uh, so the name uh, Shema is a substitution by the rabbis for the unutterable word in the scriptures. They substitute for the word Adonai, and that's where Adonai came in, or which means Lord. In our translation, Lord is the, uh, is the translation. From the translation of what? By Kiros in the Subtuagent. Uh, that's the uh, Greek version of the, of the New Testament, of the uh, Bible, that was used primarily in Jesus' time, followed by the Vulgate, which uses Dominus. Uh, we have the Lord of our vision. The substitution for the word Lord is most unhappy for in it in no way represents the meaning of the sacred name. Because Lord can actually mean, we know what it means in the Bible. And that's why we capitalize it. You'll notice in this verse here where it's, it's all four letters are capitalized. And so in the King James Version, they capitalize it to make sure we know that this particular word is, uh, is deity. But that uh, the word Lord could actually mean uh, can be used for, you know, even a master, you know, uh, if it please my Lord, you might hear something like that from like a, a servant to a master. So that uh, that's the problem with the word Lord is that uh, it's not definitive to only deity, but at least in the King James, they always capitalize it when it's, when it refers to God. So the key to the meaning of the name is unquestionable. Remember I mentioned that word I am. Uh, given in God's revelation of himself to Moses by the phrase, I am that I am. And we'll end with that. That's in Exodus 3.14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent thee unto you. Also in uh, Exodus 6.3. I prepared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Uh, so that... Uh, we will stop there for today. That actually is everything I had for verse one, uh, right on time. Not too bad, 38 minutes. And so, uh, got a long ways to go. Got past verse one, but I gave you a little introduction too about uh, God and uh, his diff different attributes. And we got a little bit more uh, to know as we move forward in, uh, uh, in this great study of uh, Genesis, the beginnings. So let's end with a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I will praise you, Father, and thank you so much for this time we get to spend in your word, Lord. Uh, and look forward to this study, Lord, and you help me to uh, prepare it uh, in, uh, with you in mind. Send your Holy Spirit to help me at all times to continue to be truthful and honest with your word. And we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I will talk to you again tomorrow, and I hope you have a great day.